Hey everybody, it's Party Elite with another episode of Total Breakdown, featuring one of the finals matches from ESL 16. Ninja Hund brings Britonia to the field once more, fighting against the Vampire Counts, led this time by Undiage. An extremely close battle with very intense moments, let's get right to army composition. Britonia comes in with Leon Kerr in charge, alongside a damsel, two paladins, six units of spearmen at arms, five units of peasant bowmen, and two units of grail knights. You'll notice that two of the spearmen at arms are ranked up to rank 2, and the remainder are ranked up to rank 1. Meanwhile, the vampire counts have Vlad von Karstein in charge, alongside two white kings, two units of skeleton warriors, three units of skeleton spearmen, three units of graveguard, the sternsmen, and two units of blood knights. One of the skeleton warriors have been ranked up to rank 1. And remember, if you're not already following Ninja Hunt on Twitch, you should. Links are on screen and in the description below, and his near daily battle streams are worth watching as he is one of the best Total War players out there right now. With that said, to the battlefield. As always, we're going to start with just a little preview of what we're about to see. First things first, Ninja Hun's deployment, as you can see, is very wide and very strange, so to speak. But he's making sure he's protected from all angles of approach. You'll notice he's got his peasant bowman up front, just in case Onjaga decides to come down the middle, or come in from the sides, or transition over from one side to another. Any sort of aggression down the middle here, Ninja Hun has covered with his ranged units. Meanwhile, if anything comes in from the flanks, he does have protection with his spearmen off to the sides here, and even down the center. He's got these spearmen here, and on top of that, he's got his Grail Knights off to the sides here. So they are able to go in and swing in for rear charges, pincer maneuvers, whatever might be required of them as needed. So very interesting deployment here, but very sensible, making sure he's covered from all sides. Meanwhile, you'll notice that Anjage is moving forward right away. He deployed off to the side here, making sure that he's not funneled as he goes down this central position here because he wants to have some width. He wants to be able to go in from multiple sides, which you wouldn't be able to do uh, facing off against something like this with these, uh, with these hill ends on either end. So he is pushing down the side here. And what ends up happening is uh, Anjage pushes over to the side and tries to push up the hill, and Ninja Hunt keeps the hill and is forcing down up here instead. Uh, momentarily, Anjage will try to pull Ninja Hunt down, try to bait him down with some patience, but as we've seen before, Ninja Hunt is a very patient commander. He takes his time, he's willing to wait longer than most other generals are, which oftentimes gives him the advantage on the battlefield. So you'll see here very slowly, Onjage does advance. He is running his troops over, though. I would have liked to see that been a, be a simple march order. But uh, again, that's just a matter of helping with uh, fatigue. It's extremely important, especially when a battle is going to go on for a very long time. Also important to note is that uh, Onjage's forces don't actually have any terrifying units. They are all frightening, and not one of them causes terror, which is an interesting call because uh, the peasants of Britonia have middling leadership at best, and so a little bit of terror can go a long way, especially because it can break and route units that are close to routing without having to wait that extra minute or handful of seconds even. Now, his... Uh, Unfortunately, Onjage's desire to try and bait Ninja Hun down means he's pushed his forces back here and deployed further back rather than simply being full-on aggressive and deploying a little bit further up front. That creates a situation where Ninja Hun is actually able to form his lines up before the engagements begin. Again, his units had a long way to travel from this other flank, but they were all able to get there just in time. And meanwhile, Leon Kor and the Paladin just uh, flying around not really scouting or anything, it's not like any units were hidden, but taking a good look at exactly what's going on, uh, just able to, I guess, tease Onjage more than anything. So you'll see, again, Onjage is just setting his lines up here. He now has full vision of Ninja Hun's army. Uh, when he was down in this position over here, uh, many of these units would have been hidden because of the, uh, the height situation, but he now has full vision and he knows exactly what he's up against. So uh, you'll see Ninja Hun doing a little dance there before finally pulling away. What would have been a good move by Onjage, you'll see as he's sort of starting to push up the field here, it would have been wise for him to take perhaps one of the Blood Knights and uh, alongside a White King and gone around the rear here nice and early because right now Ninja Hun is completely stationary and he is in control of his formations. That simple movement may have caused a little bit of disarray as he had to adjust his lines before engagements began. Now as these units are moving up the hill, uh, you will notice there was initially some focus fire, these skeleton warriors took the brunt of damage, and now there's a little bit of uh, split fire here on these two graveguard units. Again, graveguards do have a better sense or ability to block uh, archer fire when it's coming in from the front, so it may have been better to focus down on these skeleton warriors, but of course, graveguards do 
pose a bigger threat. So it's reasonable, of course, to focus down on them. And it looks like Ninja Hun's just trying to spread some of the damage so that uh, he's going to have an easier time overall rather than on any single flank. And here you'll notice the charges do go down. He's rushing down the field. He wants to make sure the engagements happen right away, and he's able to uh, hold down soldiers as possible. These Grail Knights as well being forced down, trying to get some early damage. And you'll, you'll notice right away these Skeleton Warriors, having taken some of that early damage from the Archers, they've already given up on the fight and they are falling back. Meanwhile, on this other flank here, the Blood Knights are pushing forward and they are trying to pierce through along with these spearmen to try and get to these grail knights back there however these spearmen are able to just get in the way here and they're now fending off the sternsmen as well as these spearmen uh of course these grail knights do come in to assist and cause some damage and meanwhile on this main battle over here you see a lot of magic going down quite a bit of abilities being popped as well we have got uh, the sword of quran dropping alongside the curse of the midnight wind as i mentioned in the previous battle that is a great combination it basically negates a bunch of these units here that are clumped up so great cast there uh, allowing bretonia to take advantage of this situation because most of these units now are largely negated and uh, with leon kerr in there as well uh, it was extremely helpful because he can now cause damage to uh, von karstein without having to worry about too much damage himself unfortunately Unfortunately, Master of Beguilement has also gone down, so that does help counteract the value of Harmonic Convergence that has also gone down. So like I said, there's quite a bit of spell casting and ability use here, just trying to gain that advantage early on. It's extremely important, especially when you're playing as Bretonia, because the longevity is not their strength. You'll notice also this cast just slightly affecting uh, this unit of Grave Guard here, so great placement there of that cast, that widespread helps a significant amount overall in this combat. Now you'll notice also these Blood Knights finally being peeled back and pushed aside to come up from the rear there. However, some of these peasant bowmen were targeting those Blood Knights, so they are tracing them as they run around that side. Meanwhile, on this side over here, you'll notice the Skeleton Warriors are sort of relaxing a little bit. Uh, they should have been very quickly pushed in to either chase after these peasant bowmen or to come back and close in on the flank to try and win this flank a lot quicker because these spearmen are actually doing extremely well. You'll notice because of those combined abilities early on and the use of, you know, Curse of the Midnight Wind uh, alongside the Sword of Courant, uh, you'll notice that these guys are pretty unhurt. They're relatively undamaged, whereas in the center, uh, you know, the Bretonia had the numbers advantage, they've still taken a fair amount of damage, and off to this flank over here, the Spearmen are finally about to fall apart. They are up against quite a challenge, though Sternsmen are no joke of a unit. So you'll see how the abilities have made a huge difference. Even though these guys were up against the White Kings and Vlad von Karstein, they've managed to survive. Now finally, these uh, Skeleton Spearmen, or Skeleton Warriors, sorry, going up here, and finally, you know, taking advantage of this flank while on the side here, you notice the uh, the Thunderbolt go down to try and cause some damage to Vlad as well as these White Kings. Now, meanwhile, these Blood Knights finally able to come in and charge in on these uh, Peasant Bowmen. And you'll notice Ninja Hun, either on purpose or inadvertently, but whichever it is, it's very helpful, pulls some of these Peasant Bowmen back, leaving this one up here. Now, the reason why that's helpful is because if all of these units had simply been pulled back, uh, the Blood Knights would have just given chase and engaged them all very easily. However, because these Peasant Bowmen stood stationary, they actually, in a way act as fodder and an interception unit against the Blood Knights. So you'll notice that though some of these Blood Knights are able to trickle through and engage the other peasant bowmen, uh, these two are able to get away scot-free and the large majority of this engagement happens here. They are pinned, allowing the Grail Knights to push in as well. And a well-timed curse of years makes sure that these units are moving slowly now and their attack efficiency is reduced as well. So great use of magic once again just to reduce the efficiency of these responses. The Grail Knights are not able to respond as quickly to the developing situation and at the same time their effectiveness is also significantly reduced their melee, melee attack has been dropped by quite a bit now leon core also has been pulled back here to assist with these blood knights to prevent this situation from worsening because with rear access those blood knights could have caused a significant amount of damage though they have already you'll notice these peasant bowmen have started to give up and that is causing a mass route many of these spearmen are also just running away abandoning the front meanwhile this paladin up in the front both of these paladins actually having a hard time this one was routing for a little bit there having been completely broken and now this one is routing as well so tough situation for Bretonia to be in all the character units are surrendering the front line has fallen and they are falling apart into different directions which just adds to the trouble because if and when they do reform it'll be harder to bring them all together of course meanwhile over here you'll see these blood knights still causing trouble Grail Knights holding off as well as they can. Leon Kor trying to pop as many leadership bonuses as he can, trying to keep everyone in the fight for as long as possible. Also, uh, you'll notice the uh, Sword of Koran goes down again, just trying to help and negate the effectiveness of the enemy units here. 
this is a very precarious situation for these units. Again, Vlad von Karstein is no joke in melee, and two White Kings are extremely dangerous. Uh, one is off here. He's been chasing some of these units away, but finally decides to come back into the fight. Leon Kerr, again, just flying in the air, trying to regenerate, keep himself alive. You'll notice some of these peasant bowmen, they are firing into combat here, and every once in a while, they will be obstructed. So it was uh, a little bit of, uh, again, hindsight 2020, but a little bit of an oversight there, this peasant bowman positioning. It would have been better had they been positioned in some sort of a box or off to the side so that when uh, the time came, they weren't stuck obstructed. Now over here back in this main engagement during the melee, you'll see another few spell casts going down. We've got Invocation of Nehek trying to keep these units alive for as long as possible. And at the same time, Curse of the Midnight Wind going down as well, just to try and negate their effectiveness. You'll notice that the majority of Bretonian infantry has completely surrendered. They're all running far off the field, slowly recovering, needing to be pulled back quite a long distance. And these spearmen as well, now having to go uphill to engage in combat so this is a tough situation for Bretonia to be in ninja hund is in quite a pickle to put it nicely uh, you'll notice though again these uh, these peasant bowmen they are obstructed right now would have been great had they been repositioned as I mentioned earlier or had they been down to focus onto these uh, skeleton warriors instead or sorry these grave guard instead uh, also these grave guard off to the distance here they had been stationary for a little while finally being uh, pushed in now to engage uh, again, same situation here, these peasant bowmen, if they'd just been engaged, that trickle damage would have been taken care of nice and early. Meanwhile, these skeleton spearmen, however, they have the right idea, coming in from the rear here, causing a bit of a situation once again for Ninja Hun. His focus is probably almost entirely in this uh, horrible melee right now. He is in a terrible position. Uh, Leon Kerr out, stepping out for a little bit just to regenerate some of his health and then forced back into combat, uh, dropping as many buffs as he can, putting down Stand Your Ground, making sure these guys stay in the fight because if they start to break, that is the end of the battle for Bretonia. Now you'll see over here in the rear as well, these spearmen finally making it back, these Grail Knights as well. So it's time to try and protect this rear flank before these skeleton spearmen are able to just collapse from the rear completely. Now, uh, again, Leon Kerr having to take another break, just trying to regenerate. Meanwhile, Vlad von Karstein, his regenerative capabilities actually have been capped out. He is not going to be able to regenerate anymore, so now is the time to sort of focus down on him, and that's exactly what Ninja Hun tries to do. You'll notice he's pulling Leon Kerr in to just try and cause some damage, popping Deadly Onslaught and Foe Seeker, just doing whatever he can to reduce the effectiveness, or rather increase the effectiveness of Leon Kerr. Uh, but again, as he gets pinned down by two White Kings, he does have to pull away. Uh, meanwhile, in the rear here, you'll see two Skeleton Spearman units are now engaging the one Bretonian Spearman unit and the other Bretonian Spearman unit just far behind, just trying to catch up, cause damage as soon as they get there. Uh, let's skip ahead a little bit. You'll see this engagement just uh, bogs down Ninja Hood's attention. That is the only place he can look at right now because, again, it is a precarious situation to be in. Two White Kings, Vlad von Karstein, very dangerous units, and the Sternsmen are no joke either. They're an extremely effective unit. Regiments of Renown are very powerful, and that's why they cost as much as they do. And once again, you'll see Leonkar having to retreat the... Uh, in fact, routing the Master of Beguilement going down on him, reducing his effectiveness entirely. So it's essential to keep an eye on that. And very fortunately, he is able to recover. He does decide to come back into the fight, uh, stationed out there for a little bit, hoping for some regeneration. Uh, just a little bit left on his uh, regenerative capabilities, you'll see. Uh, meanwhile, again, Vlad in the center here, alongside the White King, trying to take care of this Paladin, trying to get him to break. Ultimately, Leon Corp being pulled in, uh, trying to just get this paladin to stay fighting, drops Stand Your Ground, hoping to bring him back into the fight, but he is already routing. That is too little, too late. He has given up and he's on his way out. Uh, of course, Ninja Hunt is hoping that effect just helps bring him back in later. That's all the use for Leon Kerr there. He wasn't going to engage. He just wanted to make sure that, that paladin didn't run off completely, and that is what happens. Meanwhile, again, the Spearman unit just able to fend off these skeleton Spearmen. Both units starting to crumble and fall apart. So, you know, these weak peasant units able to do an extremely important bit of duty for the lady. Meanwhile, Leon Kerr only able to just sit and watch as these peasants fall. Uh, he is very low on health, just hoping for some regeneration, focusing down on Vlad von Karstein with these peasant bones and trying to get him to drop dead, an essential, essential piece of the puzzle for Bretonia. And you'll notice in just a moment here, uh, with some focus fire from these archers targeting everyone down, finally, Vlad von Karstein does fall in a good historical fashion, taking a few arrows to the eye. But of course, that's not the end of the day for Bretonia. 
uh, the huge advantage. The near victory conditions right now means that these guys are not going to start crumbling too easily. As you can see, the Grave Guard still chasing units away. Sternsman still, you know, trying to chase some units away as well. White King ready for more fighting. He could take on another army all on his own. His morale is right up there right now. But this does give Ninja Hunt an opportunity to reform his units. You'll see he is pulling his army uh, off to the back here. He wants some time to recuperate a little bit. He pushes Leon Kerr as well as the Paladin up, just trying to keep vision on these units. He wants to make sure he can keep a track of them, doesn't lose where they are. These spearmen are also recovering right now, so they will have to go quite a bit of quite a ways to uh, re-engage if this is where the engagement happens. Now, I would have liked to see some of these units marching around. You'll notice they are all running right now. It would have been nice to see a little bit of marching because, again, fatigue is extremely important in combat. A lot of negative effects of fatigue. Uh, it can be, it can be, well, battle deciding. And, in fact, I would have liked to see, had these units been walking around as opposed to running around, if the outcome of this battle would have been different. Meanwhile, you'll see here as well, again, these spearmen at arms rushing down to try and assist their brothers, trying to make sure some of these men can go home to their wives and kids. But uh, again, all Leon Kerr can do is patiently watch and command his troops. He has to be used in a very crux manner. Same thing with the Paladin, because the White King is a very efficient unit. You'll notice he drops down deadly onslaught and foe seeker and then dives in, completely destroying this rear unit of Brave Guard, making sure they're not able to charge in as well, negating their charge and more or less destroying them. And the Paladin and Leon Kerr together now focusing down on the White King. Sword of Coron goes down as well, uh, damaging the effectiveness of the Sternsmen, the Grave Guard, and of course the White King as well. The Paladin just barely hanging on to life. The White King finally, finally falling uh, with this focused fire, so to speak, from both Leonkar and the Paladin. And now it's time to take care of the Grave Guard. Uh, of course, these Spearmen at Arms are trying their best. They just came in from this long run over here to engage just a little too late because the other unit of Spearmen that were already holding that line, they have given up and they've run off in various directions. You'll see over here, Leon Kerr has taken care, more or less, of this unit of Grave Guard. So it's now Leon Kerr versus the Sternsmen and uh, 10, 10 Grave Guard. So the Grave Guard aren't the big concern here, but definitely the Sternsmen. And Leon Kerr does what he can. You'll see the Paladin has shattered completely. He's on his way out, as have all the other units. So it is Leon Kerr against the world. And as small as the world might be right now, that is quite a bit of damage they can put out. Remember, Leon Kerr cannot... Uh, regenerate any more health. He has been capped out now, and uh, he now has to deal with this situation. You'll notice their health is extremely close. A little bit of aerial acrobatics there, uh, helping Leon Kor, maybe giving him some self-confidence boost there, but this is a tough situation, and it could very easily go either way. Of course, uh, the morale, or rather the fatigue bonus, is going to help Leon Kerr, dropping in Stand Your Ground as well, just helping his melee defense, making sure he can last for a little bit longer. I can imagine Ninja Hun was slamming that button furiously, and there you have it, a Pyrrhic victory, victory for the lady, Leon Kerr all on his own, able to fend off those last few units, and it could have gone either way. If Stand Your Ground hadn't gone down, this could have gone terribly for Bretonia. This was an excellent battle, showing the power of perseverance and patience. Using character abilities and spells appropriately is essential to winning such close matches, and a single misclick can completely ruin a tight situation. Ninja Hun's situational awareness and quick response times helped him win the day, and Leon Kerr's aerial acrobatics were just icing on a very precariously baked cake. This match could have gone either way, and this high level of play is exactly why more people should participate in Total War tournaments. As always, for more Total War content, make sure you subscribe to this channel, and I'm still looking for more battles from all levels of play. I have quite a few submissions, I still need to go through them from the past, but new submissions are always welcome, especially since they integrate the new meta. With that said, thank you guys very much for watching, and I'll see you on the battlefield.